Scorpion Band fam, this is Mr. Schooley, and welcome to another episode of Careers in Music. Today we are joined by Juan Ruiz, drum major and clarinet player, Yesenia Rivera Cruz, head drum major and flute player, and Ed Jones, tuba player for the Fort Worth Symphony and adjunct professor for the University of Texas at Arlington. So, before I go any further and start the questions and interviews, we're going to go ahead and turn it over to Mr. Jones. Let him speak about himself for a few seconds. Um, uh, I am the principal tuba with the Fort Worth Symphony Orchestra, and I also teach tuba at the University of Texas at Arlington. Um, before that, I uh, taught at uh, Texas A&M University Commerce. I was there for almost 20 years. Um, and I grew up in Kansas, um, uh, Jewel, Kansas, um, population 600, and we only had about 100 kids in the entire high school, if you can imagine that. Um, but, is, interestingly enough, um, with only 100 kids in the high school, we had about 70 kids in band, and we had all but maybe three kids were in the choir. Um, so we had a, it was an interesting, interesting place because everybody did everything. I played football. I was in band. I was in choir. I was in the, the little chamber choir. I played in jazz band. I was in drama. I, I, you know, everybody just did everything there was to do. Um, so we, um, you know, I had a, a pretty diverse background up there doing that kind of stuff. Um, I figured out early on that I needed, I wanted to have a career in music. Um, I wasn't really sure exactly what that was going to look like at that time. I also played bass, uh, electric bass. I, I played bass in a country and western band. I started doing that when I was 14 years old. And, and for a while, I really thought that's what I wanted to do. And I was contemplating moving to Austin or Nashville and trying to eke out a career doing that. But I went to, to college instead. Where did you go to college? What did you study? I went to undergraduate school at Fort Hayes State University in Hayes, Kansas. And I studied music education. Um, and my plan was to be a band director. Um, but that didn't happen, uh, not because I didn't want it to, but because uh, other opportunities came about. Um, I went to graduate school at East Texas State University. It's now called Texas A&M University Commerce. And uh, that's where I met Don Little and, and studied with him. Um, I was able to, to take my tuba lessons at North Texas, even though I was doing my degree at um, East Texas State. And I studied tuba performance at, in my graduate work. Um, how did you get involved in your current job? Uh, in 2001, um, Fort Worth Symphony had an opening. Um, Don Little, who was, had been a tuba player in the symphony for many years, uh, retired from the symphony. Um, and they opened up the position as a part-time a principal tuba position for one year and it was a, a small local audition I think there were 13 people that auditioned for it um, I won that audition one year became two years and, and during that time I was driving back and forth between commerce and Fort Worth doing both jobs um, then in 2003 in the spring um, they made it a full-time position and they had to have a national audition because they hadn't had one yet. So I was the runner up. I came in second in that national audition, but the person who won turned the job down because the New York Philharmonic was having an audition later that year. Um, and he wanted to be free to take that, that audition. So he did. He did take that audition and ultimately he won that audition. So he is still the, the tuba player in the New York Philharmonic. So I, I, I lost to a worthy opponent. <clears throat> um, uh, I, I felt bad that I didn't win the audition, but I didn't feel bad that I lost it to, to someone of that caliber. Um, but 
ultimately, I, I did get the job, and in 2003, we moved my family here to Arlington, and uh, uh, at the same time, I started teaching at UTA, um, and I've been doing both jobs now, well, Fort Worth Symphony since 2001 and UTA since 2003. How much do you practice? Um, I, well, now, <laughs> since uh, we're kind of sheltering in place and have been essentially for uh, uh, over a week now, um, you know, I've, I've been practicing, um, you know, maybe three or four hours a day um, just because there's really not anything else to do. Um, you know, we had such terrible weather for the last week and a half or so that I just kind of sat in the house and practiced a lot. Um, but yeah, I'm, you know, I'm kind of trying to get myself into a, a regular routine um, where I get up and, and I'm playing the tuba by around nine o'clock or so in the morning. And I try to play for an hour, an hour and a half, and then get another hour, hour and a half in the afternoon and maybe another hour in the evening. Um, and, and just try to schedule practice time so I so I'm I get into a routine rather than just kind of aim, wander around aimlessly and just say oh I think I'll go play the tuba for a little while you know and that way I'm I'm a little bit more organized about it. Uh, before this happened when when I was um, doing work <laughs> and not working from home um, I was um, um, I, I typically would would start playing the tuba probably around 7.30 or so in the morning and try to play for an hour to an hour and a half before I had to leave the house. I generally would leave the house to either go to UTA and teach or to go to Fort Worth for a rehearsal or, or something around nine o'clock. So I would try to give myself an, you know, an hour to an hour and a half to get in the morning and then... Um, depending on what the day looked like, usually if I'm at UTA, I would have another hour or some, something during the day that I could practice. But if not, I would, I would always try to practice at least an hour at night. So, you know, I would say uh, on a typical day, it would be anywhere from two hours up to three hours. Um, but that's not, you know, that's not always the case because it, every day is a little bit different. Um, some days you don't have a chance to practice during the day. Sometimes you have concerts at night and you can't practice at night. So, but it's not unusual for me to have the tuba on my face and play for five hours a day, but not all of that is practice. Some of that is rehearsal and some of that is performance. How do you, okay. like, what's your process for learning a new song or a new piece? Um, my, it, it, that, again, it, it kind of depends um, it, it depends on what it is I'm learning. If I'm learning a piece for the orchestra and it's something that I've never played before, and, and in, in the Fort Worth Symphony, we tend to do a lot of new contemporary music. We've, we've commissioned a lot of work, so we were playing it for the very first time. Um, some of it is, is pretty difficult music. Um, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll just take a, a, a look at it. Um, I'll get an idea of the tempos, where the tempos are going to need to be, but um, something that's really, really difficult that I know that I'm not going to be able to sight read very well. First off, I will just, I, I will find a tempo that's ridiculously slow. I mean, stupid slow. You know, if, if the tempo is supposed to be at quarter note 100, I might take it at, you know, eighth note equals 80 or something like that, less than half tempo. And, and the, the trick is to find a tempo that you can play it, that you can kind of work your way through it. Um, there's a lot of different practice techniques that kind of go along with that, but I try to find a tempo that, I, that I'm, I'm certain they'll have a certain amount of success and be able to sight read through it at a very slow tempo. And then from there, I start working through the details and then speeding it up at the same time. Really, the technique isn't a whole lot different if you're if you're working on a, an etude or a solo. It's really kind of the same way. You have to take it slow at first. Slow practice is a good thing. Um, that's kind of a mantra that I tell my students. Slow practice is a good thing. And and when I say slow, I mean slow means really, really, really slow. Um, I always use a metronome. 
Um, I use a tuner for reference. Um, in my, my practice, when I'm working on fundamentals, long tones and things, I'll use a drone. Um, but when I'm working on a piece of music, I, I tend to not use the tuner unless there's some things that I think might be suspect. And what I'll do is I'll turn the tuner on. When I get to a note I'm not sure about, I'll hold that note uh, to find out where it's at. Um, sometimes we play things that are new to me that, that, where, that are, uh, have been played before and have been recorded. And I always try to access recordings and listen to the recordings. As I get better at a piece and able to play everything at tempo, I oftentimes will play along with a recording, uh, especially with orchestra music. I don't do that very often with solo music, but I do with orchestra music. With solo music, I want to develop my own interpretation of it. I don't want my interpretation to be a copy of somebody else's. So I, I, I don't do that very often. In fact, I, I never do that with uh, learning solo music. But I think the key is, you know, again, I, I sound like a broken record, but I think the key is to practice slowly and, and just really, really, you know, find a tempo where you can have a high level of success uh, starting off and then gradually, just little by little, crank that metronome up. It seems like it takes a long time and it's really tedious, but the fact of the matter is you'll learn a piece of music much faster that way than you will just kind of going at it. Um, randomly at fast tempos, um, you wind up, when you play things fast, you wind up um, learning mistakes. And, and then it takes a lot longer to unlearn the mistakes than it does to learn it right the first time. So that's my answer, I think. <laughs> what do you listen for in music? Okay, what I listen for in music is, um, I, I listen for um, to put it in one word, I listen for beauty in music. You know, I listen for things that, that really move me. Beauty of sound, beauty of phrasing, um, uh, you know, beauty of ensemble, if it's say an orchestra or a brass quintet or things like that. I mean, just, um, I, I, I listen for things that, something that really speaks to me uh, in some way. And, and it uh, doesn't have to be orchestra music or, uh, brass quintet or tuba music. Uh, I really like to listen to choral music um, because I think there's a lot of choral music that really um, has a lot of beautiful things to say. Um, recently, I've listened to a lot of Russian choral music. I don't understand a word they're saying. I have no idea what they're, they're singing about, but the music is so wonderful and beautiful and the, 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 the choral technique of Russia is is so spot on that it just it's really relaxing for me to listen to so yeah I just I just listen for for you know the the beauty in music whatever that is who is your music inspiration um, well I have a lot of uh, musical inspirations I think the very first one I had was my grandfather my my mother's father he was a, a, a real music lover and he had a huge collection of uh, recordings, classical music. Um, he was, he ran a hardware store in a very small town in Kansas, but he came from a very, very musical family. In fact, his brother um, was a concert pianist and later became the uh, chairman of the department, the music department at Michigan State University. Um, and he was also, uh, interestingly enough, if Here's a little research project for you, for you, for you band kids. Look up the name Clarence Sawhill. Uh, Mr. Schooley probably knows that name. Mm -hmm. And my, my um, great uncle, Roy Underwood, was Clarence Sawhill's beginning band director. Started him on trombone and baritone. Um, you can look that up. If you look up Roy Underwood and Clarence Sawhill, you, it will be confirmed by Google. So um, that, that's an interesting fact. But my grandfather, he, he also was a band director. He started the school band in this little town. Um, he was a euphonium player of, of some renown. I never got to hear him play because he had bad teeth. And by the time I was, a, I was born, he had false teeth. So I, I never heard him play. 
but I know that he was a very, very fine euphonium player. Um, but I used to, I used to spend a lot of time at my grandparents' house, especially in the summers, and I would listen to his recordings. And he had a lot of recordings of the of the Eastman uh, Wind Ensemble with Frederick Fennell conducting. I listened to those recordings over and over and over and over again. He also had a recording, a really famous recording that I, I know Mr. Schooley probably knows of the uh, brass uh, sections from the Philadelphia, Cleveland, and Chicago Symphony playing Gabrielli. I practically wore the grooves off that record. In fact, I still have that record. That was one of the few things I was able to salvage from his record collection. I listened to orchestra recordings, you know, and and then when my grandfather would come home from work, he would always, first thing he'd do, he'd sit, go to his living room, put a recording on, whatever he was in the mood for, and sit in his chair and listen to it. And if I was there, he would tell me about it. He would tell me about that, what that music was about. So that was a, a very early influence. Uh, oddly enough, I think another influence for me for tuba, um, I grew up in the 60s and their uh, cartoons were on television all the time. And um, all the cartoons, uh, the Hanna-Barbera cartoons, the Flintstones, all those cartoons had really fantastic tuba playing on them. All that tuba playing was done by one person, a guy named Tommy Johnson out in California. And I think I, think I, I watched those cartoons so much and I, I was attracted to the sound of the tuba. Um, and I, I, I just sort of knew what a tuba was supposed to sound like because of that. Um, and so when I started beginning band, when I was in, in uh, fifth grade, I knew what the tuba was supposed to sound like. And I just sat down behind my sousaphone as a beginner and I sounded like a tuba. I sounded like I, what I thought Tommy Johnson would sound like playing that sousaphone. And so I think that was an early influence. Um, you know, another really big influence on me was my first real tuba teacher. He was a, a band director. Um, and I was able to get hooked up with lessons from him. He was a band director in a different town, but a friend of my junior high band director. And I, I went and took lessons with him. And he was really, his name was Chuck Roush. Um, he was really a great teacher. And he really set me straight on a lot of things. Um, Chuck also had the unique distinction of for a very short amount of time, he held the world's record for eating the most the most donuts in one minute. He, he, was, he had the Guinness Book of World's Record, but he never made it into the book because someone beat his record. So <laughs> I don't know what that number was, but um, so those were two really early influences. There's a, a lot of others. There was a um, when I was when I was uh, a kid living in Kansas um, in Nebraska the polka is king and there were these television shows on like Saturday and Sunday afternoon of, of where they would feature local polka bands. And so I started listening to polka bands a lot. And there was one real famous one, the Six Fat Dutchman. And I bought a, a Six Fat Dutchman recording and I listened to it and I listened to it and I played along with it. And I found out, and the tuba playing was just astounding. I mean, it was just so clean and so precise and I found out just a couple of years ago who that person was his name was Dirk Hammock and he was up in Minnesota and North Dakota and Nebraska South Dakota he was the man he played in a lot of polka bands and um, and there's a lot of recordings of on YouTube of him in various bands that you can hear so you know that was another one I've, I had kind of a lot of strange influences and of course the the teachers I had in college, Lyle Dilly was my undergraduate teacher, and Don Little was in graduate school. Don, as I said before, was really instrumental in kind of putting me the right down the right path as far as just some really fundamental things on tuba. You know how how to make the how to make the tuba do musically what I wanted it to do. You know, be more efficient about it. So those were my influences. Yeah. What is your favorite part of your job? Favorite part of my job is, is sitting on the stage with 70 of my best friends, really my best friends, um, and, and making great music. Uh, the tuba sometimes has a really small part in that, but 
even even when that happens, um, even when I only have a few notes to play in, in a concert, I'm getting paid to sit and listen to great music. And there's not many people that can say that. And and that really is is my favorite favorite part of the aspect of the whole job. I get to make great, beautiful music with my very best friends. Okay. Yes. What is your favorite joke? Okay. So my favorite joke. What's better than one bar? Don't know. Give up. Two bars. <laughs> All right. Do you own any pets? I do. I have a dog named Mo, and I bet if I stood up from my chair and opened the door and called him, Mo would come in here. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Mo, come here. Mo. Here, I'll tip this down. There's Mo. Oh, you see his face? Sweet boy. He's, he's a good boy. He's a really good boy. He's about two and a half years old. Um, we got him from a shelter uh, about three weeks ago, or no, about six weeks ago. And he's, uh, he's very calm for the most part, but he's also, at the same time, he's very playful. He loves to, um, here's, yeah, he loves to play fetch, and he loves to play tug, and he loves to go on walks. And he's very, very friendly. He loves to have his throat scratched, as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but this is Mo. All right. There you <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> what is the wackiest experience you've ever had? Um, without going into a lot of detail, it involved uh, playing a Christmas um, program at a mega church. Um, in the Dallas area, and um, there were um, live animals on stage. There were um, a choir of probably four or five hundred. There was um, uh, a smoke machine. There were people rising up out of the the stage, and then overhead during the performance, we we heard this commotion, and we looked up, and there was a guy in a harness. Um, in an angel costume, and they were trying to lower him down from the, the overhead area, and he, they had the harness on wrong, and he was kind of sideways, and he was struggling and kind of in this weird twisted position, and they were lowering him down, and he was kicking the ceiling, and pieces of the ceiling were falling down on us, <laughs> and the thing was, he was directly above us, and we didn't know if he was going to come loose from the harness and come crashing down on us or not, but we were the bass trombone player and I were prepared to jump and run in opposite directions if we saw him coming down. So that was, that was a, a, a real bizarre experience. I wanted to ask him, how has the COVID-19 affected you? Oh, well, you know, it's, it, it's affected me a lot because, you know, the, the Fort Worth Symphony is canceled everything <laughs> at least through the end of May. Uh, Bass Hall, Bass Hall has, has closed through, I think, mid-May, and, and all of our programs are, have been canceled out through the end of May. Um, one of the biggest things that we do during the year is the concerts in the gardens, out at the Botanical Gardens, and we don't know if that's going to happen or not. Um, we are still getting paid as of right now, but we don't know how long that's going to continue. So, um, but we're doing okay for now, but you know, it's just, it's just a weird time because, you know, musicians, musicians have to make music and, and we have to make music with other people. And yes, I get a lot of practice time, but it's, it's, it's not the same. I miss my friends. I miss making music with my friends. And so having that contact has been really, really difficult so far. And it's going to be a lot harder before it's over with, I think. So that's that's how it's affected me the most. Mr. Jones, would you do you mind playing a little bit for us? I would be happy to. Um, if you would give me just a second, I need to rearrange a little bit because I want to. I don't want the microphone to get overpowered by the tuba, and I'm going to turn it down a little bit. Uh, Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Stay safe. Stay well. <laughs>